Probably a few Clemson graduates, any Clemson graduates in the room? I always say Seneca is near, near Clemson, but when I grew up there, it was not a college town by any means. Uh, also, for over 25 years, I practiced law at the Weich Law Firm in Greenville, South Carolina, and probably represented many insurance companies over the course of my career. It may have represented some of you all, but whoever I dealt with has probably since retired. Uh, from your companies. But now at this uh, advanced stage in my career, uh, we're empty nesters, or oh, we thought we were empty nesters. Uh, next, in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna have our first grandchild uh, who'll be, and the family will be in our home for a while. So we've gone from empty nesters to the Waltons overnight. <laughs> Uh, but now that we thought we were empty nesters, uh, I have moved on to working for the Southern Environmental Law Center, and it is a really unique place and a great place to work. Uh, it is a law firm that is, believe it or not, I know you won't believe this can be true, it is a nonprofit law firm. And uh, we don't charge our clients legal fees. That's, you all can sign up, I'll give you my card afterward. <laughs> Uh, but we're supported by individual donors and foundations, and we work in uh, the southeastern United States. Our, our focus is on the quality of life and the environment and the well-being of our southeastern states. And by the southeast, you can see we mean Virginia, North, and South Carolina, the Carolinas, Georgia, Alabama, and Tennessee. I live in Greenville, but I, my office is in Chapel Hill. Uh, so I focus on those two states, but work uh, throughout those states. We have some 50 attorneys, and we have an off offices in all those states uh, working on, on issues of importance. So we try to take a regional view, but we have local, uh, local roots and ties and knowledge of what's going on. And I was asked to talk about what keeps me awake at night or what are the big uh, some of the emerging environmental issues. You all are probably aware of these, but I'm going to start with a one that's occupying much of my time, and that is the issue of coal ash. And uh, sometimes with my accent, people can't understand what I'm saying, so I'm saying <laughs> coal ash, A-S-H. Uh, and uh, this could be in any, many different industries and it can be small sites. I'm going to use as my example the uh, uh, coal-fired electricity generating industry. Uh, but it could be, and as you'll see, that's all over the southeast, but it could be other industries. It could be small, much smaller electrical generating facilities. It could be other uses of coal. Um, the problem, main problem with coal, coal that has been often disregarded and not paid close attention to is that after you burn coal, something is left over. This is cynical logic. This is not really a difficult topic, but it is a surprising topic when you hear about it. What, what uh, has been done in our region and in many parts of the country for decades, and I know you're going to find this hard to believe, is that we store coal ash and dispose of it by digging a hole in the ground and putting it in the hole. It's that simple. These holes are unlined. Now, there are two things you need to generate electricity from coal. You need coal and you need water. You need water. So most of these coal-fired plants, all these coal-fired plants are built next to major bodies, major or small bodies of water. They're either on a river or a lake. So these coal ash holes in the ground are unlined and they are next to major waterways. They are separated from these major waterways and lakes only by earthen burns. Now, some people call them dams. I don't think these barriers rise to the status of a dam. Uh, they are, by and large, earthen berms. Some of these, ho these holes in the ground were built in the 60s, 30s, 40s, 60s, 70s. 
Some of them were designed by engineering firms according to the standards of the day in the 60s and the 70s, but some of them are just old borrow pits or gravel pits. Some of them were built by Cousin Fred and his bulldozer, and the berm was put up there. The, the, the coal ash, believe it or not, is stored in a wet state. It is stored in wet lagoons. Now the reason for that is the easy way to transport it was to slurry it from the plant. And this, let's see if we, do we have a pointer? This is Duke Energy's coal ash lagoons overlooking Mountain Island Lake in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we are on the Catawba River. Does anybody know what Mountain Island Lake is? What's the significance of Mountain Island Lake? It is where Mecklenburg County and Charlotte, all this water you're drinking, came out of that. And you see how big this is. That, these little things are vehicles. So you are storing huge quantities of coal ash separated from Mountain Island Lake by an 80-foot tall earthen berm. Now, I don't think I have to tell you that nobody in their right mind would do that today. And I don't think any, even, uh, even the most rudimentary permitting agency would allow such a thing to be done today. Now, coal ash, you might think, well, what's the big deal? It's coal ash, just coal ash. What, what difference does that make? Well, coal ash is not a pleasant substance. It contains some of the most mean and evil toxins. You may know this. One, one, some of the leading materials we find in coal ash are arsenic. We knew in Seneca that was harmful. But it also contains selenium, which is very dangerous to fisheries. We get, it contains uranium, mercury, cobalt, lead, manganese, chromium, some, in some places chromium. Another difficult substance called molybdenum. Hard to pronounce, but you do not want that in your fishery. Uh, not only do these uh, lagoons, not only are they beside these waterways, they discharge into them. They discharge into them through permitted outfalls, but through unpermitted outfalls, and they discharge into fisheries. But they inevitably, you might easily figure this out, if you put that much water and unlined in a hole in the ground next to a waterway with just an earthen berm around it, it will leak. Now this is not Mountain Island Lake, although Mountain, although Mountain Island Lake is leaking all around it. And it, that's undisputed, they admit that in the newspaper. It's leaking all over the place. But it doesn't take a Harvard Law degree to figure out that's probably not legal. And that is coming out of a coal ash lagoon in one of our southern states flowing into a waterway that flows into a major river. Now there are two other things going on right now that raise the concern. One is we are spending billions of dollars in our country, you all may know, to clean up the air pollution that comes out of the stacks of these coal-fired plants, and particularly things like mercury. And the re part of the reason for that is if you spew these toxins out of the stacks, it scatters it over the landscape, and then in a diffuse form it comes to earth, and then it enters the aquatic systems and gets into our ecology and sometimes into us. Well, now we are using 20th and 21st century technology to remove that stuff so that won't happen. And guess where it ends up? In the coal ash. And then we use 13th century technology to store the coal ash after we've used 21st century technology to remove the toxins to put it in the coal ash. And instead of scattering it diffusely across the landscape and letting it enter into the aquatic system, we concentrate it in one place and emit it in a concentrated form into a single waterway. Uh, 
That is problem one. Problem two is, as you all have read in the newspaper, a number of coal-fired plants across the country are closing. So decisions are being made as to what are we going to do with the coal ash. And believe it or not, many utilities are walk not all, but many utilities are walking down the path. We're just going to cap it and leave it there in perpetuity, forever. Now, I do not have to tell you that many of our uh, regions in the southeast are subject to hurricanes. They're in high-risk earthquake zones, and we've had many, as we'll see later, severe climactic events. And I just do not believe over time, once you cap a coal ash lagoon and move on to the next topic in five and six years, you're going to assign your most careful, ambitious, well-trained, observant employees to monitor it. I could be wrong. But even if you do, there's a re these facilities are going to continue to leak. This illustrates the magnitude of the problem in the southeast. Now, these are only major utilities. These are not the smaller utilities, commercial utilities. It's not other industrial sites. But there, there is at least one set, and often in, in just in the Charlotte region of the Catawba, three sets of large coal ash lagoons on every major river system in the southeast, virtually every one. In, in uh, South Carolina, my home state, it's every major re river system in North Carolina most. So it is a major issue that faces uh, our entire region. Uh, I want to talk about a few, two examples that would bear on your work. This is the risk of catastrophic failure. This is the TVA, what happened after, you've heard of the TVA failure in 2000, 2008 at Kingston in Tennessee. But this is what that means. And let me give you some facts. It's sudden, unexpected collapse. Over one billion tons of coal ash hit that river and that community. Twelve homes were flooded, lake and river contamination, a train wreck, because you know most, they're bridges and roads, highways, trains, and a fish kill. The volume of this one coal ash lagoon, this is just one, this spill was a hundred times more in volume than the spill of the Exxon Valdez. This just is one. I'm not talking about the whole southeast, it's one. Uh, $11.5 million penalty was imposed by the state of Tennessee on uh, TVA, which is the largest penalty they've ever imposed. It's remarkable to get state of Tennessee to do anything as to TVA, uh, but they impose their largest penalty. To date, there have been 60 lawsuits and 800 plaintiffs. This was not a highly populated area, by the way. Uh, TVA, you, if you all fa filed the litigation, TVA has been found liable. The litigation is still ongoing now. This occurred in 2008. We're in 2013. Uh, this spill occurred despite decades of TVA stability analyses. So if you hear, if you're doing underwriting, which I are, are connected with it, and you hear, oh, we, the regulators haven't raised any concerns or haven't told us, we've done everything the regulators have told us to, and we don't know if we don't have any report that tells us it's going to fail, be careful. And here's an illustration of why to be careful. This worries me more than Tennessee does, in a way. This is Wisconsin. Wisconsin is not the most um, reluctant state for environmental regulation. This is on Lake Michigan, which is a carefully, you know, the Great Lakes, careful attention is being paid to the Great Lakes. This had been stable for years and years and years. In fact, they had built an entire facility on top of this coal ash storage without warning, without an earthquake, a hurricane, a flood, a terrorist attack, an explosion. There was an unexpected catastrophic failure. These are large transfer trucks to give you the idea of the magnitude. The reason is unclear, but the thinking is that 
at the bottom of this storage facility there was a small creek and it had been flowing unbeknownst, nobody saw it, they had been flowing for years, it entered in the lake and over time it caused weakening. Well all these lagoons are near, some of them are built in streams, but all of them are near water flows. So in some ways this worries me more than Tennessee. That's one illustration. The next illustration I want to point you to is the now major litigation over plant shearer in Juliet, Georgia. Is anybody here familiar with that? Is everybody, I got copies of the complaints. Uh, you can see uh, that's plant. You can, I hope this is a little, uh, not totally clear, but that's a, it's a big plant. Plant shearer is owned by Georgia Power, the Southern Company which you all may know is one of the major utilities and major institutions in the country. I have a colleague who says until he started working in this area, he thought Georgia Power was named after the state of Georgia. But after working in this area, he's decided the state of Georgia was named after Georgia Power instead. Uh, this is one of the largest electric generating facilities in the country and in the world. It's the 20th largest source of carbon dioxide pollution in the world. It's the fifth largest electricity generating plant in the United States. It's the largest generator of carbon dioxide in the United States. There are residential neighborhoods nearby. And you can imagine they have some big coal ash lagoons. Here they are. I emphasize Georgia Power and the Southern Company because they're not a defendant you would necessarily pick out to sue if you were a plaintiff's firm. It's a big, powerful institution in the state of Georgia. Well, nearby there have been a rash of diseases, organ diseases and cancer. These lagoons are unlined. Uh, this came up in the press earlier last year, in early last year. Uh, the residents have found uranium in their drinking water, and uranium is one of the uh, evil uh, substances that can, can be found in coal ash. And now there are 13 filed lawsuits and 50 are promised. They are being brought by a law firm from New York, Pentus and Mullins. Do you all know Pentus and Mullins? They are the law firm that recovered $850 million for the 9-11 workers for their inhalations or their injuries afterwards. So this is, they don't, you know, this is a big significant operation that doesn't pick out cases unless they plan to prevail. Uh, and so you will know in the region, here's the flyer uh, that was being passed out in the community in the neighborhood. By the way, let me make clear, Southern Environmental Law Center, we don't sue for money. In other words, we don't represent plaintiffs seeking money. We represent community groups, environmental organizations, local citizens uh, seeking to address pollution issues. So we seek solutions. And most of what we do, in fact, is not litigation. It's policy work with state, local, national government, local communities, private entities, and others. But this is what the plaintiff's firm uh, in New York is handing out. Um, before I go to that, I guess what I would emphasize uh, on this is in addition the range of claims. Uh, RICO is alleged, racketeer influence corrupt organization because of alleged involvement of the various corporate entities to prevent the lagoons from being lined. There's a wrongful death claim, fraud and negligence. So uh, the Southern Company and its insurers and the other owners, it's not owned only by the Southern Company, are going to face a long period of litigation. I'd also point out that there's a growing uh, number of proceedings, some from us in the southeast under the Clean Water Act. Uh, we have filed three notices of intent to sue facilities for leaks, for violations of their permit, for unpermitted discharges. Um, that provides civil penalties. That goes to the government. Um, and I would also point out that the firm from New York is not the only plaintiff's firm looking at this, wor at this world. Um, I can tell you from direct knowledge. So you can, I think you can expect um, more litigation 
uh, in this field. So what would be my summer about coal ash? Well, it keeps me awake at night. And first, it is um, a tremendous risk. Second, there's growing attention from public interest firms, but from plaintiff's firms and from regulators. You can't, in evaluating the risk, you cannot rely upon regulatory compliance. These are powerful entities that the regulators don't easily push. And it is not just utilities. The other point I would make is this. Not every utility is sticking with this fight. South Carolina Electric and Gas in South Carolina has entered into an agreement with us to remove 2.4 million tons of coal ash from the banks of the Watery River and store it in a dry state in a lined landfill and to remove the arsenic contaminated soil. And they generally are moving all their ash away from this wet storage by South Carolina's waterways. On the other hand, Santee Cooper's fighting to keep doing it. So not all utilities are taking the same approach, but I would point out the way I think about it is this is a an entirely unnecessary risk for the corporation, its executives and shareholders, and its insurers. Over a period of time, this ash could be moved, this pollution could be ended, and all the, although the expense and the risk of catastrophic failure avoided, and although the expense to you and me would be huge in terms of the cost and va of operating these electric utility facilities and the magnitude of the investment and the magnitude of the possible reputational, legal, and financial risk, it's really a small cost. But right now, to the extent you insure them or others, uh, I guess you all are bearing that risk for uh, the utility, so, or for others, uh, too. So th that would be my summary there. So that's one big fear that keeps me awake at night. What if Mountain Island Lake broke and those lagoons broke at Riverbend and entered Mountain Island Lake? That would be. What if we had a significant earthquake in Tennessee? Tennessee, Charleston, South Carolina, Tennessee are big earthquake prone areas. What if a hurricane hit Conway, South Carolina, near Myrtle Beach and sent the ash at Granger into the Waccamaw River? All those are real possibilities. Second thing I would mention, and this is a small point, but I think overlooked, is the risk of old dams, not coal ash. This is just plain old dams in the southeast. Let me give you an <laughs> idea of the magnitude of this. Uh, how many of y'all are familiar with the Greenville, South Carolina area? Well, you know we have the Saluda Reedy Rivers. So just that watershed, just Greenville, Lawrence County, just that small watershed has 2,500 impoundments. 2,500, just in those two counties, in the, the, those two watersheds. Not counting the Ennery, which is also in Greenville County, but just that watershed. And from my personal observation, these old dam, these dams are getting old, worn out. Are people maintaining them? And it's a tremendous risk as our experience with severe climactic events occur. And so my next topic, which relates to that, is the problem of our Piedmont rivers with climate change. We are seeing more and more severe climactic, unexpected climactic events. And we have all these Piedmont rivers that run through towns and communities, sometimes old mill villages, sometimes downtown areas and others. And we are having, occasionally, but when they happen, it's a humding or major storm events, which turn these modest rivers into very dangerous Niagara's. If you, again, how many people have been to Greenville, South Carolina? We have something we call the Reedy, and we call it a river. Now, that's a river only in the stretch of an imagination. It's a very small creek. It has a big waterfall in the center of town, but there's not much water there. That is the Reedy River in 2004. Unexpected. It wasn't a major na uh, national hurricane or, uh, or a tropical storm. There was a small, mini climatic event up near Furman, beyond Furman, at the headwaters of the Reedy River. Boom, dumped all this water down. And within a short matter of time, the Reedy River was nine feet above flood stage. 
and stuff that had never been considered at risk was wiped out of existence. And give you one illustration, which is the scariest one, and luckily nothing terrible happened, but there was an old lumber yard by the Reedy River that had been there for years, decades. This flood wiped it out. I mean, just took it off the face of the earth. But more disturbingly, it picked up all that lumber and sent it flying down that river like torpedoes. These four by fours were going through the center of town. And after it was all over, they were found impaled into the banks, into trees, wedged against rocks. We are just fortunate that nobody was killed or seriously injured by that debris. Luckily, they ran away uh, from this flood. But it is, an, if you've ever been there, it's a, that's the Reedy River going through downtown Greenville that day. Unexpected. This happened, I just came back from Nashville. Many, if any of y'all are familiar with Nashville, it's, I guess you wouldn't call it Piedmont City, but it's Cumberland River had a significant climactic event and wiped out downtown Nashville. So I would say if I were doing risk evaluation, anything in a floodplain of our rivers that we normally have thought is not a problem, I would look very carefully carefully at. And the final point I would make in my 30 minutes and just show you some pictures, we all know the risk of climate change at the coast of our states. But I don't think you can fully internalize it till you see it visually. And that is the Outer Banks. Now see, that's where <laughs> houses were. That is the major highway. And this is happening repeatedly. This was a regular highway for that section of the Outer Banks. Now the ocean is moving over here. Now our friends at NCDOT are not to be discouraged. They are com they're determined to rebuild this road. <laughs> and look at that. There it is. And this is the, when I grew up in Seneca, is an old expression called, there's no education in the second kick of a mule. You know that phrase? <laughs> there's no education in the second kick of a mule. Now look at that. That is NCDOT repairing a highway. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, they'll take the third kick and the fourth kick and the fifth kick and keep letting that mule kick them over and over again. But I think, <laughs> What this, and sooner or later, hopefully, they're going to learn and say we've got to, even NCDOT cannot fight the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, but uh, hopefully we'll learn. But what this means is we hear about climate change and we read about it and we hear about sea level rise, but over time the impacts of these stronger storms and sea level rise will dramatically affect what goes on in your industry along to the extent you insure along the coast as well as the Piedmont rivers. So those are things that keep me awake at night. I'd be glad to uh, take any questions. Yes. Well, the coal ash to me is not that hard to solve as long as there would be a willingness to do it. What we ask for in our uh, litigation and our policy advocacy is not the ideal solution. We ask for a modest solution, and that is you treat this coal ash as though it was this stuff here. Common household garbage. And that is put it in a line landfill, in a dry state, away from the banks of a water reservoir, <laughs> without a dam, with groundwater monitoring and treatment of the leachate that comes out of the uh, landfill. That, in other words, in South Carolina, we call that a class three landfill, a class three plus. Now, that's gonna take time to do. Uh, in one place, what SCE&G is doing, where they don't have, the lagoons are not as close to the river. This isn't an ideal solution, but what they're doing is emptying one lagoon, lining it, 
drying out the ash and putting it back in, emptying the other lagoon, lining it, drying out the ash and putting it back in, and then capping it. So there are many solutions, and if you think it can be done over a period of years, uh, for the utilities, you would think it could be built into their rate base. Now, I'm not a utility financial expert, but it doesn't have to be all done all at once. And it, it is, as I said, compared with the cost of operating, constructing, uh, the capital cost of one of these major systems, it's, it's not a big number over a period of years. So for coal ash, that's possible. Now, it can be time consuming and difficult to permit new landfills. So there, you know, there are factual specifics, but in many instances, there are places to put it in it. The least you could start with the most dangerous and most perilous lagoons and work on them first. Duke Energy, for example, I understand, going forward is looking to dry storage. But the question is, what do you do with Mount Nine Lake that's already there? And over time, uh, I think, and, and let me say this too, you know, back up and don't think of just today's problems. Long term, is that gonna, is that gonna be acceptable? what y'all saw, this way of storing this coal ash. I mean, as somebody once told me, with some issues, it doesn't matter what poles, if you polled this, I'm sure it would come out bad for the coal ash, but it doesn't, with some issues, it doesn't matter what the poles say, you know in the long run, that's just not gonna hold. In the long run, is that gonna be tolerable? Sooner or later, that's gonna have to change. It's almost inevitable. I mean, nobody would defend it. How do you defend unlined coal ash with arsenic in it, separated by an earthen berm leaking next to a water supply? You just, it's, or, or with cobalt or whatever the substance may be. It's indefensible long term. Sooner or later that's going to happen, so why continue to incur the risk? Why not amortize it over time and move away from it? How do you, how do you get it into the landfill? Truck, truck. Generally, what they do, what they would propose to do, is you would uh, you you take out and dewater it to the extent you need to. It's whatever works in that. Let me put it this way. It's highly dependent on the particular specifics of that location and where they're taking it to, and the nature of the ash they're moving. But in general, you would probably dewater it to some degree at the site. A lot of this is not, as I said, 21st century technology. You dewater it at the site, put it in a truck, take it to the new site. There might be more dewatering there and, and dump it in a truck, dump it from the truck into the landfill. Line landfill, appropriately line landfill. Now if you did, by the way, that's not perfect. These landfills are gonna start leaking at some point, probably, but for now, that's, we need to avoid the major catastrophic risk, the catastrophe. Take that off the table for the region and the immediate direct pollution of waterways. <laughs>